My name is Keith Cambrin. I'm an amateur radio operator with the call sign Kilo Charlie 1 Alpha Tango Tango. And this is a video describing a set of tests that I've done using the protocol FT8. In particular, it looks at noise immunity of that protocol. This particular video is just an introduction to how the tests were designed. Subsequent videos will give uh, actual operation of the individual test and describe them and give some results and some analyses of each of those tests. So what is FT8 and how does it work? Uh, as I mentioned, FT8 is a protocol. It's a extremely robust protocol uh, that has error correction uh, embedded in it, and we'll talk about that at some length. To use FT8, you really need three things. You need a PC, a personal computer, you can also use a Mac or a Linux computer, the application WSJTX, which you can find on the web, and here's the website of the author, Joseph H. Taylor. His call sign is Kilo One Juliet Tango, and he's a professor at uh, Princeton University, and he's also a Nobel laureate. Apart from the computer with the application, you need a radio. In this particular diagram, I've shown an ICOM 7610. I happen to own the predecessor of this, the 7600, and I run WSJTX FT8 protocol and other protocols with this combination. And of course, you need an antenna. The antenna has to match the band you wish to use. Again, FT8 is a robust digital mode, and it operates from 1.8 megahertz up to 70 megahertz. So throughout the HF band, and even slightly above the HF band, made very it's very easy to operate uh, over the spectrum because of the way WSJTX interface works. And I'm not going to take time in these sets of videos to describe the interface because others have described it. Uh, much better than uh, I can here. I mentioned that it uses a sound interface. Now that sound interface does not have to be acoustic. In fact, it's better if it's not. In other words, you're not generally using a speaker and a microphone. In this radio, as well as many others, you can establish a USB connection for the um, audio, both the transmit and receive functions, and that'll give you a much uh, higher quality of sound if you use the USB. The protocol itself is very interesting in that it uses half duplex. The protocol sends for 15 seconds, and at the end of that 15 seconds, it'll receive for 15 seconds. It cannot send and receive simultaneously. These 15 second intervals have to be timed very precisely because the person you're communicating with on the other end is using those two 15 second periods in exactly the opposite way. When you're sending, uh, that operator is receiving and when you're receiving, that operator is sending. That means it requires a network time synchronization, WSJTX does. And that's accomplished uh, by loading some network time synchronization software that's described on this site. I heartily encourage you to go to this site, uh, even if you don't plan to uh, adopt the protocol, because it's, um, it's just worth reading if you're at all interested in communications. The protocol itself only sends 14 characters per message. So it's a bit different than other protocols and other modes of amateur radio, such as CW, continuous wave, which uses Morse code, or voice communication via single sideband, or even some of the other digital modes like uh, radio teletype, uh, PSK31, and so forth. Only th 14 characters are sent and received in any one of these 15-second uh, intervals. However, 
that is sufficient for what you're trying to do with FT8. And you're not trying to do what hands call rag chew, that is, have a long conversation. You're only trying to make a contact and verify that the contact has been made. So signal to noise is of particular interest in FT8. Strength lies in signal to noise. How does signal and noise affect radio communication? So here I've drawn uh, one radio, one operator's QTH or his location in his or her ham shack. And then I've got a distant operator who has a similar rig and they're going to communicate over some distance. And the distance could be hundreds or thousands uh, or even 10,000 miles. So transmission is global. There are thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of operators using the uh, FT8. It has become extremely popular in a very short period of time because it does not require much power to go around the world. I typically operate with about 30 watts and almost everyone in the community using FT8 uh, operates with a similar level. So you can receive signals from anywhere in the world uh, with FT8 but while transmission is global, noise is local. So the, the signal from the foreign operator or distant operator is going to be attenuated and it'll be received by your antenna at a very low signal level. The noise at the far end where the transmitting operator is will be attenuated in a similar fashion so it will be imperceptible or nearly so at your receive site. However, noise is local. The noise that matters to your transmission is noise that is generated where you are and where your uh, antenna is. And that's what's going to affect our communication. And that's what we're going to look at in these series of tests. What is this noise? Well, we can break it down into various types of impairments and study each impairment individually. The first one we'll look at is broadband Gaussian noise. So broadband Gaussian noise is sometimes called thermal noise, or I would guess I would say thermal noise is a category of broadband Gaussian noise. Um, the ham operators, uh, if it's in the environment, call it QRN, that is natural noise, and we'll see that it's very broad in nature. Uh, FT8 has a pass band, that is the active part of the frequency channel it uses, is about two and a half kilohertz wide, and so this noise can occupy that whole band. A second type of impairment or noise is single frequency interference. And one example of that is CW operators. Um, there is no separate part of the spectrum reserved for FT8 operators. And so uh, CW operators are perfectly free and perfectly valid for them to operate in that area of the spectrum being used by FT8 operators. The CW tone is a single tone, and it'll appear within that uh, part of the spectrum. And if it happens to uh, hit the uh, uh, particular frequency that you're using for FT8, then we're going to see single frequency interference. A single frequency interference can occur in other ways. Your computer may uh, have an oscillator in it or a timing uh, circuit that emits a particular frequency that happens to interfere with your radio. Another category of impairment is band-limited noise. So what is band-limited noise? Band-limited noise generally occurs when there's uh, some other operator using a, a band-limited mode. Examples would be AM transmissions from a commercial broadcast uh, transmitter or even uh, FM transmissions uh, 
or um, often is another amateur operator using a broader band digital format such as Olivia, uh, which will uh, be wider and show up on your screen as a, a wider band than FT8. Uh, that can affect your communications, uh, even if it's not in the same frequency you are, if it's just in the same band, and we'll see how that works. And finally, there's impulse noise. Impulse noise is the particular impairment that's very difficult to pin down. Uh, the other uh, impairments, we can generally understand where they're coming from. But impulse noise is a noise that comes and goes very quickly, or it may repeat itself at random intervals, and all we see are spikes in the spectrum, uh, and it may be difficult to locate where it's coming from. A car starter, uh, an air conditioning uh, unit starting, uh, particularly troublesome, or arc welders, if there's any arc welders in your areas. There's just a whole variety of sources that can, can create these impulse noises. So we're going to simulate all of those in the empirical study and then uh, take a look at how they affect FT8. So here's how we're going to do the experiment. We'll begin with step one and we're going to co-locate a mic and speaker. Um, the PC doesn't really have an easy way to set up a internal loop back to audio. There is some software out there, but I found it pretty easy just to co-locate um, a speaker with a very good microphone. So these two will be set up beside e right beside each other for the test. And I was very careful not to allow any other noise in my Radio Shack while I did these tests uh, so we can get a very consistent result. There's a software application that's free and it's a really nice package called Audacity. So um, Audacity is the tool we're going to use to capture tones and to play back tones on our test. As you note, there's no radio and no antenna required for this particular test. Uh, in fact, that eliminates a lot of unknowns and unpredictables. We're going to have very consistent results because we're going to see computer-generated tones fed back into the um, computer and we'll watch WSJTX both create them and to analyze the results. So once we've set up this hardware arrangement, uh, we can turn Audacity on and then we'll start WSJTX so we can transmit an FT8 and we will transmit a test message. The test message will be sent out over the speaker because WSJTX thinks it's talking to a radio and then it will come back into the microphone where Audacity will be listening and record it to file. We're going to save those test messages and it'll be the same message repeated several times and then build a transmit loop. Now by that I mean we'll build a precisely timed loop with these messages and Audacity has the feature that allows to play that loop endlessly over and over and then that gives us ample time to inject noise and look at the results. And that is step two. So in step two we're going to download noise files and I'll give you the source for that and these are a well-constructed noise files are pretty precisely built and um, we can get noise files for broadband noise, for impulse noise, uh, band limited Gaussian noise, and so forth. Then we're going to build noise loops just like we built transmit loops. Uh, we're going to need to mix the noise so we'll build a noise loops that just loop the noise as well as loop the transmit. And in this step, Audacity is the only tool we need. We don't need WSJTX. And then to do our test, step three, we'll mix the test message, that looped test message, with the noise. 
We'll set the noise level that we want to use and we'll start the test by starting Audacity in synchronization with FT8. They have to be synchronized because of that 15 second precisely timed interval. Um, and we'll set various levels of the noise, keeping the transmit message at a consistent level and raise the noise and watch the effects on our received message. And that's uh, how we're going to go about it. And we just have to, once we've started our test message and noise, we just have to receive the result, uh, make our measurements, and then move on. I'd like to acknowledge um, the author, again, uh, jo Professor Joseph Taylor, and the great work uh, they've done with WSJTX. It's one of the best applications uh, I've ever seen, and it's just um, once you understand the configuration like everything else, it really works well and is easy to use. And that partly explains why it's been so widely adopted. And they continue to make improvements to it. Uh, Audacity is a, also a great piece of software. Anyone interested in audio uh, would be well advised to go look at that application and use it. The tone files I got from this uh, particular URL and um, you, there's a free level uh, of the wave tones you can get. Uh, I subscribed to the site because I wanted uh, tone files that were uh, a little more challenging and a little uh, had better filtering in it. And the video ed editing is done using an application called Camtasia. I've used it before, and it's uh, authored by TechSmith. Uh, I find it to be very complete and very feature-rich.